I think we have to be mindful of two things. Can we dismantle speciesism through the Holocaust language? And can we be mindful of others' potential trauma so that we can navigate it in a productive way? I'm not gonna get through this without some coffee. This is gonna be a nightmare to edit. Hi there, I'm Jeremy from veganinteractions.com. Welcome to another video. So this past Sunday, Roger and I had a debate titled, Is the Holocaust Analogy Acceptable? Now, I just started doing these summary videos, and last week I was able to compress it into about five minutes. However, I'm not going to try to do that for this one because I want to cover the topic more fully and fairly, and I just don't think it should be rushed. Also, a quick point on framing. I'm going to talk today about reclaiming the word Holocaust for our fellow animals. Not so much that we're extending the definition or using it as an analogy, although I'm sure I'll accidentally say those things throughout this video. So I think we all know by now that this is a complex topic with a lot of trauma wrapped up in it, and I'll do my best to cover it objectively. So while I'll share some highlights from the discussion on Sunday, I'll also be building on some of my own ideas. My whole purpose with this video is to explore all the um, information and facts associated with this discussion so that we can go where the truth takes us. And just a quick content warning, we will be discussing mass atrocities towards both humans and our fellow animals. However, I'm not gonna show any graphic pictures. It'll mostly be through the language I use. So in this video, I'm gonna go through the um, current state of the discussion. I'm gonna go through the accuracy, the um, potential effectiveness, the potential risks, and then also how to navigate this topic tactfully. I'll then wrap up with what the key takeaways are to me, as well as share my opinion on the subject. I'll also try to focus on the issues versus the individuals because I think that's a more objective way to go about it, although obviously these two are entangled. Throughout this video, I may say some things that you disagree with, but I suspect if you continue listening, you'll probably hear some things that you agree with because I'm just going to try to cover everything as part of this discussion. And perhaps one of the biggest things throughout this whole dialogue within the movement is talking past each other, which I'll admit we were guilty of a little bit on this past Sunday. I'm not sure about getting ahead. I think we're talking past each other. So I hope this video helps to evolve your understanding and opinions on the topic, because I know my opinions are still evolving too. So before we get too much into the dialogue, let's take a bit of an inventory with where the discussion's at so far. And then I'll try to suggest a bit of a middle ground for each of these topics, and then we'll get into the detail. Now, so far looking at this topic, there has been a wide spectrum of opinions. I mean, on one end, you have people who are um, using the word Holocaust saying that the others are human supremacist or speciesist if they don't use it. And on the other end, you have people saying that if you do use it, you're racist, anti-Semitic, and, and who knows what else. Personally, I don't think name calling in these situations is helpful at all and dismantles productive dialogue. Plus with the slavery language, is everybody racist who uses it? I've also noticed a lot of incomplete comparisons as well as people digging in their heels and making the claim that there shouldn't be a debate at all. Because I think for any of us to suggest there shouldn't be a debate on this topic isn't fully acknowledging the other side of the issue. Now on the for side, the suggestion has been made that it doesn't matter if we offend people and that offense is a necessary part of advocacy. On the against side, the claim's been made that um, we shouldn't use the language at all because of the harm that might be done. And I think there's a critical discussion about offense versus harm, which we'll have a bit later. I'd like to see if there's some ground between these two positions and if we can actually use the Holocaust language tactfully to minimize the risk of triggering PTSD or STSD. The for side also talks about um, the animal's only position, whereas the against side is also talking about how if we use the Holocaust language, we'll be perpetuating that injustice. The common ground I see between these two positions is actually using the Holocaust language in a clear way that we're lifting our fellow animals up versus depersonifying um, certain human groups so that we can actually build awareness and prevent future atrocities happening to any of these groups. So on the for side, there's some that claim that maybe we should use this language anytime we want. And on the against side, I think some have suggested that we shouldn't use the language at all because it's just too complicated. Hopefully there's some common ground between these two positions and that at least we can all agree someone who's literally survived a Holocaust is allowed to use the word Holocaust when describing our fellow animals. And that's really the focus of this video for me is all collaborating on our collective knowledge so that we can share our ideas and all have a better chance of navigating the Holocaust language tactfully. Now on the for side, I think the general thought is that um, Holocaust language packs a metaphorical punch that other language doesn't offer, whereas on the against side, the suggestion is made that we should be more creative with our language and come up with alternatives. 
In between these two positions, I absolutely agree we should be more creative with our language. So let's explore what the potential alternatives might be together. And maybe we find better language, maybe we don't. Now this is the key part of the discussion to me that I think has been missing is what alternatives are we actually suggesting so that we can objectively compare Holocaust language with these alternatives, which we'll get into in a little bit. Now just a couple a bit more peripheral points is I think it's interesting on the for side how a lot of people who support using the Holocaust language also reject the idea that human and other animal issues are entangled. They also make the claims that veganism or animal rights isn't political while leveraging political events. I mean, is it really that hard for us to be consistent and acknowledge that veganism is political, but perhaps nonpartisan? On the against side, I also think it's interesting how so many individuals are speaking out on this issue, saying we shouldn't speak out on this issue. So you have people who haven't been affected by a Holocaust directly, or perhaps even generationally, telling others what to do. Now between these two positions, I think we should all find ways to talk about this subject in a respectful way. Shouldn't we be able to do that about any topic? Okay, now let's get into the detail of this battle of ideas, starting with the accuracy. Now I think it's been said enough where I think most should already be aware, but just so we're all on the same page, Holocaust is basically a slaughter on a mass scale. Now I'll cover a couple of the nuances, however I think the key here is that we take the victim-centric mentality versus the oppressor-centric intentions. Now, I can't honestly see someone denying that from the perspective of our fellow animals that this is, in fact, a holocaust. It's also worth noting that the Jewish community also seems to be moving towards the term Shoah, which is more respectful because it's not referring to some sort of sacrifice, as well as it helps to focus in on their particular holocaust. On that point, I did a lot of research about <laughs> the darkest side of humanity, quite frankly, about all of the different holocausts that have happened through history, because there hasn't been just one. So are we willing to call these other human atrocities a holocaust? I can't think of a very good reason not to. As I mentioned earlier, I think this is more about reclaiming the word holocaust because it was originally used for our fellow animals. I mean, isn't that the epitome of human supremacy to take a word that has been originally used for other animals, use it for ourselves, and then say it can't be used for our fellow animals? Also, for those of you who um, do view this as a bit of an analogy, the Holocaust language isn't meant to suggest that human atrocities and the atrocities against other animals are exactly the same or equal. It's meant to focus in on the similarities. Now there's all kinds of similarities between uh, human Holocausts and the animal Holocaust. Feel free to pause it if you want to look at these in more detail, but I'm not going to focus a lot of attention here. Because to me, this kind of misses the point. One of the most important things that I've found when it comes to our language is what the range of potential interpretations are. And I don't think there's any denying that when people will hear the word Holocaust, they think about an injustice that's beyond words. So while every injustice is unique, that doesn't necessarily mean we need to use unique language for each injustice. Moving on to the effectiveness, this is probably a key part of the discussion because there's no point in using Holocaust language if it doesn't work. As I gestured at earlier, when you hear the word Holocaust, what do you think of? I would suspect you think about some of the worst things humanity is capable of. Does that not describe animal use? Do you think that could inspire non-vegans to take animal use seriously? Now when it comes to our animal advocacy, there's very limited data as for what actually works and what doesn't work. However, I'm sure most of us by now have probably heard of someone who has said that the Holocaust language had a big impact on them in inspiring them to respect our fellow animals through veganism. As animal advocates, I think we all have to find language that resonates with us and is likely to resonate with others. And while it's important we're objective, which I focused the last highlight video around, I also think it's important for us to have some language with some teeth in it that packs a bit of a metaphorical punch. And I think one of the paradoxes around this is one of the things referring to human holocaust, and perhaps most specifically the Nazi-led holocaust, is the concept of never again and that we actually need to keep talking about the human holocaust in order to, pre to prevent it. So if we limit this language to human injustices, doesn't it actually reduce our opportunity to build awareness about it? Plus, can you think of a single mass human atrocity that's happened in history where the target group wasn't first animalized or dehumanized, or I would say depersonified? So let's think about that for a moment. If we're able to build the respect for our fellow animals through the holocaust language and our advocacy, 
aren't we taking away this tool that's been used time and time again for past oppressions? I could see our animal advocacy going a long way to prevent these human injustices from happening in the future. Plus, who here has got the objection, you vegans only care about the animals? Wouldn't a great response to be talk about these human injustices and how this animalization has been a key part? So by lifting other animals up, we can actually prevent some of the worst atrocities against humanity? Plus, when we're thinking about effectiveness, what alternative language are we actually proposing instead of Holocaust language? Now, when it comes to language, I love using the flip it to test approach because I think it really helps test my own speciesism. So let's try that for this. If we start saying the Jewish Holocaust can no longer be referred to as a Holocaust, what would we put in its place? An atrocity? A genocide, which, as gestured at earlier, is probably less applicable because that's more about wiping a group out? I mean, I've considered a lot of alternatives, but none of them packs the same metaphorical punch as the Holocaust language. Plus, I hate to say it, but if we're going to start saying certain words are reserved for human atrocities only, where does that leave us when it comes to slavery and murder? Are we no longer allowed to talk about abolishing animal use because of its links to slavery? Now, something that also relates to the effectiveness, which I'll address separately, is the potential risk to using the Holocaust language. Now, as I see the two main risks are derailing the conversation and causing harm to those who have been directly affected by a Holocaust. So while there is a potential for effectiveness, there's also potential risks that I think we should be aware of throughout all of our language. Now, when it comes to derailing the conversation, as animal advocates, isn't this something we're pretty well versed at? I mean, how many conversations do we have with people who try to pull our conversation back to animal welfare or using animals in the right way? I don't see why we can't redirect in this context. I think a key part to this is we obviously don't want to come across as trivializing past or current struggles of our audience. And as mentioned earlier, I think it's important for us to be aware of the so-called animalization being used as a tactic to perpetuate these injustices. So it's important we frame things in a way so this doesn't come across in this way, which we'll get into the specifics of in the next section. And as for those who um, have proposed that only the Jewish community is allowed to use the word Holocaust, can we please stop invisibilizing the roughly 12 million other victims of the Nazi-led Holocaust, as well as the 200 million other victims of Holocaust? I mean, isn't that perpetuating injustice, invisibilizing hundreds of millions of victims? Plus, what about the animal holocaust that literally has 3 trillion plus victims each and every year? I mean, that says a lot that we can't even calculate the total death toll. The best we can do is have an annual estimate. That says a lot to me right there about the scale of the situation, especially when we consider they're all unique individuals. And a lot of the objection um, seems to be coming from the so-called um, consistent anti-oppression um, perspective, which I'll admit I gravitate mostly towards myself. However, shouldn't a big part of consistent anti-oppression be talking about all oppression and gesturing at how they relate to one another? If we're shutting down the Holocaust language altogether, I think we're limiting our opportunities to do just that. Now, probably one of the strongest points against using Holocaust language is the potential harm it may do. And as Roger clarifies here, it's not about offending people, it's about harming them and bringing back their trauma. And I think that a lot of people tend to minimize it by calling it, oh, well, well oh, some people don't like to be offended, do they? No, 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 it's not that. It's that people don't want to be harmed. And more than that, we shouldn't want to harm anyone. Why would we? To help articulate the difference between offense versus harm, something that I think we're all acutely aware of as animal advocates is when we see graphic footage. Now, I appreciate graphic footage does play an important role in um, our animal advocacy. However, when we see it as animal advocates and we're already on board, I know for me, it's not that I'm offended by it and that I'm actually harmed seeing it and brings back a bit of the trauma I know I carry around with me from all the footage I've edited and events I've witnessed in real life. I mean, let's be honest here. I think as animal advocates, a lot of us probably suffer from uh, STSD, otherwise known as secondary traumatic stress disorder, at least in some varying degree. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be animal advocates. So I think it's important that we're mindful of this in a variety of ways, because if we're re-exposing our own community to this stuff needlessly, 
then if people are burning out because of this, I don't think that's going to do any favors to our sustainability or our growth as a movement. With that said, I do think this is an example of an incomplete comparison. Because whose harm are we talking about? What about the harm to our fellow animals? Plus, even if we focus in on human atrocities, are we saying we're not allowed to talk about Holocaust in that sense because it may cause harm? If we're okay with using Holocaust language when talking about our fellow humans, then why not our fellow animals? Now, I appreciate we live in a species of society and we have to navigate this carefully so that speciesists don't think we're pulling certain human groups down. But if we can do that, doesn't that go a long way to addressing this risk? Now, obviously, when it comes to our fellow animals, there's this extra layer of navigating speciesism on top of that. But as animal advocates, shouldn't we be prepared to dismantle speciesism? If not, then why are we animal advocates? Plus, as animal advocates, isn't a key job of ours to help support people to navigate some morally dark places? I have a faith that we can do this respectfully. I also think if someone has a strong reaction that may actually make the conversation unproductive, we should consider moving into other language. I gotta be honest here, through my research in these discussions, I'm kind of talking myself into using the Holocaust language respectfully. Now I'd like to get into what I think is probably the most important part of this video, because let's face it, some people are going to use the Holocaust language regardless of what discussions we have as a community. So we should probably talk about how to use it productively. Probably one of the most important things is around our framing. And I think it's important to bring it back to an animal-centric focus to say things like the animal Holocaust. I also think it's important that we contextualize these things and that we're not saying that these injustices are the same and that all injustices are actually unique in their own way. The thing that makes the animal holocaust unique is that the target group has already been animalized. Unlike human holocaust, where the targeted group is dehumanized. So maybe we could start to talk about how in both examples, the target is depersonified. I also think it's critical that we articulate the intention of the holocaust language is to lift our fellow animals up. And if people suggest that we're trying to make humans and animals equal, I think the response to that is, at a basic moral level, they are. And the fact that they're all unique individuals who are worthy of respect, which means not breeding, using, and killing them. We're not talking about the right to vote or drive a car. Now let's talk about this idea of who can use the Holocaust language. Are we suggesting that only survivors of a Holocaust can use it? Or perhaps members of a community who may have some family or generational trauma wrapped up in a holocaust in the past? I mean, if that's the case, technically I shouldn't be making this video. As animal advocates, isn't a key job of ours to be an ally in a sense and discuss things on behalf of our fellow animals? Hopefully we all agree that everyone should be talking about holocausts so that we can prevent them from happening in the future, not just those who are impacted by it. Plus, I think it's kind of a given that it takes a lot of energy and time to talk about these things, so why put that entire burden on the group who's been most affected by it? If done respectfully, couldn't we actually help take some of that burden away from them? So now let's talk about when to use the Holocaust language. I think one example is at least at a strategic intra-movement level, we should be willing to talk about this because the structural oppression that went into the human Holocaust is very similar to the animal holocaust. Probably one of the scariest things I learned through researching this is, as an anti-speciesist, that's kind of my focus. But when we look at human-on-human -human holocausts, there's more to that situation. And I think we need to try to understand that and the potential for all of us to be silent or even contribute to these evil acts. Thinking about the practical applications of the holocaust language is first on social media. Now, I think one of the key things we can do is content warnings. Now, I know some of you may be opposed to content warnings and that's to social justice warrior or something like that. I don't know. But there's good reasons for content warnings. I think of content warnings as a bit of a funnel that simultaneously shields those who may have a trauma associated with certain events. On the other side, I could see content warnings acting as a bit of a catalyst and actually saying, hey, this is serious. You better pay attention to this. Plus, if someone's unfamiliar with the content warning, they may be more likely to look at it out of curiosity of what it means. I know I've done that. Even for the most devout misanthropes, do we really want to expose our fellow animal advocates to trauma that may influence them burning out? I hardly see that being a good way to build a sustainable movement. 
Because let's be honest, as animal advocates, we're probably all suffering from a bit of STSD. If we hadn't empathized with their trauma and it impacted us on some level, we probably wouldn't be animal advocates. Now for live conversations, perhaps on the street or even at times on social media, one of the most powerful things we can do is ask questions. So we may actually be able to arrive at the same language or destination, but in a more productive way. For instance, we could ask, what would we call this if we're talking about the mass killing of humans? If we allow them to use their own language, they might be more likely to see where we're coming from and start to see other animals in the way that we do. Plus, I think this could provide an interesting segue to the speciesism in our language, and we could start to talk to people about the role language plays in the way we view our fellow animals. Now, similar to graphic footage, if someone doesn't want to engage with that, that's okay. Some of my best chats have been when someone came up and said, oh, I can't watch that stuff, probably because it had an impact on them. So if Holocaust or other language people seem to have an unproductive response to, let's think on our feet and be creative and move on to different things. A few other questions we could ask are, how do you respond to this if we were talking about humans and then start to bridge that divide? We could also ask them, how do you oppose a human holocaust? Because that's a pretty damn good way to articulate that we shouldn't change the way we're treating them, but we should actually be ending their oppression altogether. Now I think holocaust language, or any language for that matter, we shouldn't rely too heavily on. I think it's also important to talk about animal use to establish the overall scope because some less overt forms of animal use probably wouldn't really fit the Holocaust framing that well. Plus, I also think a critical thing we should do as animal advocates and that we're not doing enough of is to highlight the unique individuality of other animals through stories and that they're worthy of respect, which means not breeding, using, or killing them. So in general, I just think we should be mindful not to deny people of their own experiences or their own struggles and associated trauma. For instance, if we use the slavery language and then talk about how racism isn't that bad or even worse, that it doesn't exist today, I can't exactly see that leading to productive dialogue. I mean, think about things from their perspective. We're denying them their struggle and then trying to talk to them about another struggle. I mean, let's be honest. These oppression Olympics, they're building walls, not productive dialogue. Similar to the species hierarchy and where to draw the line and who's worthy of moral consideration, I honestly think that's a distraction. Why shouldn't we be drawing a circle and that all injustices are valid and that all individuals are worthy of respect? Even as animal advocates, I appreciate we acknowledge that the death toll is highest when we're looking at animal use. I think when we focus in on one injustice over another, or saying one's the worst, it moves us away from having conversations about the underlying root cause and trying to understand better what causes good people to be silent or even contribute to evil acts. Now, another example that I think has piss poor optics is if when talking about human injustices, we're calling them hypocrites. Because let's be honest, 99% of the population supports animal use. Why not focus on the similarities of the struggles and the underlying root cause? Then hey, we may even be able to start with alliance politics. So I think it's profoundly important that we're consistent, and if we're gonna talk about words that people are gonna associate with human injustices, we're also crystal clear that we also oppose human injustice. Because while the focus of animal rights will always be other animals, there's also a scope that's much wider and involves being mindful of these other injustices that have similarities. Because if we're saying things like, it's only about the animals and show an indifference towards human struggles, I think it's a lot more difficult to use this language authentically because it kind of implies this Holocaust matters and this Holocaust doesn't, or that one matters more than the other, which I appreciate we're not trying to do, but it could come across that way. So I appreciate this is a controversial topic, and honestly, I think there's valid points raised on both sides, and I'm not gonna try to pretend like I've addressed all of that in this video but hopefully this video will help nudge us towards understanding where others are coming from. Now, for those who watch the Animal Rights Show know how I love a good poll. We also did polls on Sunday, and while a slight majority seemed to favor the use of Holocaust language, um, basically the not sure shifted more towards not using the Holocaust language, which I think makes sense because if someone's not sure how to use the Holocaust language respectfully, they're probably gonna be less likely to. These results are similar to other polls that I've seen online. So obviously, if you're concerned that the Holocaust language may derail the conversation or cause harm, you don't have to.
However, I think there's also some very valid reasons for those who do want to use the Holocaust language. Now, you may be wondering at this point what my take on it is, and I'll be honest, my position's evolved, and I think humans, and specifically the animal movement, I think we're very resistant to acknowledge when we've changed our opinions, but change is okay, change is good, change is why we're vegan. So when I first started my animal advocacy, I swerved to the Holocaust language, as well as other language that's strongly associated with human injustices. I also swerved comparisons between other animals and humans because I thought this could derail the conversation. However, I've come to realize that this comparison and talking about them at the same basic moral level is exactly where our conversations need to go from a non-rhetorical animal rights perspective. It's not so much about who's right and who's wrong, but it's more about all of us being open to objectively explore the situation and go where the truth takes us. That's a key point to this, isn't it? Are we actually, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've really challenged my own speciesism through pondering this discussion. Now, I'm personally not ready to sign off on the animal holocaust or holocaust language being inherently a net negative. I'm also really struggling to think of language that packs the same metaphorical punch as talking about a holocaust. Can you think of a viable alternative? I appreciate there's a myriad of different ways we can go about things, and from a rights-based perspective, some of you may prefer to talk about rights violations. But we need to be able to describe um, what goes on with other animals in their own right, as it were, and and explain to them why that is a rights violation, and that you know that the reason we shouldn't do it is because they're rights bearers. However, shouldn't we also focus on language that's easily understood? And they'd need to use language that ordinary people would understand and, and would relate to. Like you wouldn't like you wouldn't like it if this was done to you. You wouldn't like it, it if this was done to other members of your family. Something that somebody can relate to personally. From an anti-speciesist perspective, I think that the ubiquitous rights violations that our fellow animals endure at the rate of three trillion a year and God knows how many throughout all of time is absolutely a holocaust. And it's similar enough to the way people think about human holocausts in the ways that matter. Now as for each of us deciding whether or not to use holocaust language or not, I think we have to be mindful of two things. That's can we dismantle speciesism through the holocaust language? And can we be mindful of others' potential trauma so that we can navigate it in a productive way? If we can do that, I see no reason to swerve the Holocaust language. I think there's a lot of ways we can mitigate the potential risks that have been raised in a respectful way, through our framing and providing context. And I'm certainly not in support of using our language mindlessly, which goes for all of our language. I personally see a tremendous potential to dismantle speciesism through Holocaust and similar language, and perhaps prevent these atrocities from happening to anyone in the future, be they human or our fellow animals. Imagine if we could live in a world where we could talk about holocausts in a way that's understood and universally opposed, regardless of the species involved. That's the kind of world I want to help to create. Hopefully this video goes a long way to helping us to do just that. And that's not going to happen if we ban holocaust language. So let's start calling animal use what it is, a holocaust, and support our fellow animal advocates to engage with speciesists on the topic in a way that's respectful and productive. If you found this video helpful, please do consider sharing it, um, especially messaging it to a fellow animal advocate, because you never know, it may help spark some useful dialogue between the two of you. I'm also keen to hear what you have to say on the subject, because it's an incredibly complex one, and I really struggled to compress all the ideas into a single video, so let's keep the conversation going in the comments. Also, I know this has been a draining topic for some of us, so let's please support our fellow animal advocates to continue discussing this topic respectfully and productively. If you're interested in evolving your language, which I think as animal advocates we all should be willing to do, please do check out the Unlearning Species Language Group on Facebook, as well as my um, language document on veganinteractions.com. Also, please do consider subscribing because beyond the anti-vegan algorithms, it's a really useful way to let me know that the content is useful, which means I'll keep making it. Don't forget to follow the Animal Rights Show so you can join us every Sunday for our live discussions. Thank you for staying with me through the end of this, and hopefully we'll see you on Sunday for our next live discussion. Moral truth is often extreme, and it must be. For when injustice is absolute, one must oppose it absolutely. And I think we should oppose it with our language. For free resources, such as a discussion guide and language document, check out veganinteractions.com. Thanks for watching.